Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I was born in Palestine in uh, the city of Hebron in Arabic Al Khalil in 1955 and uh, grew up in Kuwait, uh, but then received my education in the UK from uh, the bachelor degree to the PhD. My specialty is um, Islamic political philosophy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've written a number of books uh, on Islamic political thought as well as uh, on Islamic movements. My uh, most recent book is uh, published in the, U in the USA under the title of Hamas, A History from Within. Um, I've worked as a lecturer in a number of universities, but now I am uh, uh, retired from academia, but uh, quite involved in the media. I run a TV channel in uh, London, based in London, called Al Hiwar uh, TV. Yes. In Arabic means dialogue. <coughs> Well, uh, very briefly, probably just to give some background information, Palestine is a piece of territory that uh, until about 100 years ago was always part of a much bigger power. So it was ruled in ancient times uh, by various powers until the Muslims uh, came to it in the uh, uh, sixth, uh, in the seventh century, in the seventh century. And then after that, uh, it was ruled by different destinies, uh, by different uh, dynasties, sorry, uh, the last of which was the Ottomans. Now, in the latter days of the Ottomans, uh, so much happened in the world that culminated in the First World War. And the First World War led to the collapse and disintegration of the Ottoman uh, Empire of which Palestine was part. And colonial powers, the, principally the British and the French, took over the area which is known today as North Africa and the Middle East and divided it between them as colonies. And uh, uh, the, the, such colonization uh, uh, gave rise to the modern territorial states. I don't call them nation states. I call them territorial states because they are based on territory rather than on nation. And all these Arab countries uh, from Morocco all the way to the Gulf, uh, except for Palestine. Palestine was placed under British mandate and it was the British for their own colonial purposes that empowered uh, a European movement called Zionism that emerged among secular Jews at the moment, at the, at the time, because most uh, religious Jews were opposed to it, and some of them continue to be opposed to it until today. And that empowerment of Zionism led to the uh, massive uh, migration of Jews uh, from Europe, uh, be, uh, especially after the Holocaust, prior and after the Holocaust, to Palestine, where they uh, declared uh, a Jewish state called Israel in 1948, uh, a year known to the Palestinians as the Nakba or the catastrophe, because it led to the massive expulsion of Palestinians and their dispossession, the seizure of their lands and of their homes. Uh, now, the remaining part of Palestine that wasn't taken by the Zionist movement in 1948 was occupied by Israel in 1967, of which East Jerusalem was part. And this brings us to today's uh, crisis. Why we have a crisis today? Because East Jerusalem, which which was uh, until 1965, uh, sorry, until 1967, pre predominant, pre, uh, uh, predominantly uh, Palestinian uh, populated, was immediately annexed by Israel in a process of unification with the rest of Jerusalem. And since then, the Israelis have been bringing in settlers into various neighborhoods within Jerusalem and expelling the Palestinians out or forcing them out somehow. The most recent of which is the neighborhood known as Sheikh Jarrah. Sheikh Jarrah is a Palestinian neighborhood in East Jerusalem. The settlers have been moving in, uh, wanting to take these houses. They use the uh, Israeli judici judiciary or court system in order to legalize uh, their action. P 
people couldn't take it anymore. So there was uh, a friction that led to um, a flare up. And then this month, this Ramadan uh, coincided with the anniversary of the annexation of East Jerusalem. So Jewish settlers wanted to celebrate that occasion. They decided to organize a massive demonstration uh, to pass by uh, or to pass through uh, Al Masjid Al Aqsa, Al Aqsa Mosque, that is, which to the Muslims is uh, the third holiest place on earth, a very uh, significant uh, shrine. And that led again to another flare up uh, and to the crisis. Now, um, Palestinians called on Israel to desist, to stop its provocations. They didn't listen. Eventually, the Islamic resistance movement Hamas, which is based in uh, Gaza uh, nowadays, issued uh, an ultimatum to the Israelis that by six o'clock uh, on Monday, that is last uh, uh, Monday, not, not, not yesterday, the Monday before, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't stop provoking Muslim worshippers and harassing them and preventing them from performing the rituals, we are going to take action. And action started uh, exactly as promised at 1800 local time uh, on that uh, Monday. And now we have not only a war between Gaza and Israel, mm -hmm. which is not the first war. There was a war in 2009. There was one in 2012. There was one in 2014. And we have this one uh, in 2021, these are the major ones, uh, but we have another uprising. Uh, we we have uh, we are seeing now an eruption of a third intifada or a third uprising across Palestine, all towns, all villages, all cities. And today was a general strike everywhere. I hope that this very brief <laughs> account uh, can help uh, mm -hmm. enlighten you about what's going on. Of course, peace is possible, but in order for peace to prevail, you need to have justice. It's impossible to have peace and security if people on both sides don't feel that they are being treated justly and equally. Now, the problem we have today is that there is occupation. Like in the case of every colonial project, if colonialism continues, if oppression continues, there will not be peace. Because this war or this conflict is not between religious communities as uh, Netanyahu is uh, trying to tell the world through his actions. This is a purely political conflict. Muslims, Christians, and Jews can happily live together if nobody is attacking another, the, the other. If nobody is taking somebody else's house, I mean, take for instance, my case. My mother was 16 years old when she, her parents and her siblings were thrown out of their house in Beersheba in order to accommodate incoming Jewish immigrants from Europe. How can we forget that? And there are millions of Palestinians who live in refugee camps in the West Bank, in Gaza, in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Syria, and many others who are scattered around the world who can tell you stories about their parents or their grandparents or about themselves who were dispossessed and thrown out of their homes. So if, suppose tomorrow, the Israelis come and say, Palestinians, we are sorry for what we did to you. We want to live in peace. Can we? Of course, we will say we can. So long as you acknowledge that it was wrong what you did to us and you are willing to work it out, we can live together as human beings. But so far, they are not doing this. Instead, what are they saying? They're saying God gave this land to the Jews according to a promise to Abraham. Of course, if, they, if mm -hmm. somebody believes this as his religion, it's up to him. But I know that this is my land, this is my house, Mm -hmm. And therefore, there will never be peace unless there is justice. The idea of a two-state solution came up when a faction of Palestinians uh, reached a deal with the Israelis called Oslo. 
at, the, at, at Oslo. This was called the Oslo Agreement. And the understanding at the time was that if peace prevails, Palestinians can have their own state in the territories occupied by Israel in 1967. Now, although this doesn't solve the problem for all the Palestinians, but it was accepted by a good number of Palestinians at the time because it seemed the only way forward. However, since then, since 1993, when that deal was reached, Israel has been confiscating more land, building more settlements, expanding existing settlements, demolishing more Palestinian homes, dispossessing more Palestinians. To the extent that even uh, Israeli uh, human rights organizations such as Beth Salem are saying, actually there is no more land left for the Palestinians to establish a state on. But let me tell you about my personal opinion. My personal opinion is that we Palestinians don't want to have a state. What's the point of having a state? The issue is not having mm -hmm. a state. The issue is going back home. Now, whether that home is in a country called the United uh, States of the Middle East, or it is called Palestine, or it is called Jordan, or it is called Egypt, it doesn't matter. What matters is giving people back what is theirs. This is the issue. So if say there is a Palestinian state established somewhere, what about the other parts where Palestinians are not allowed to go back to their homes? It doesn't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. If we want to solve the problem, we need to do like they did in South Africa. In South Africa, they had a regime very <laughs> similar to the Israeli regime ruling through a system called apartheid. Apartheid means racial segregation. Today in Israel, there is a different form of apartheid. It's religious segregation. If you are Jewish, then you are superhuman. You have first class citizenship. If you are not Jewish, then you are subhuman and you don't even have, I wouldn't say second, not even third or fourth uh, class uh, citizenship. That doesn't mm -hmm. work. Like they did in South Africa, they got rid of apartheid and everybody became equal. We need to do the same thing in Palestine. No more Zionism, no more claims that the Jew is uh, better because God favored them. Jew, Christian, Muslim, atheist, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever, we are all brothers and sisters in humanity. And it is not justified for any of us to take somebody else's home or deny them their basic rights. No, no, not necessarily. I, actually, I argue in my book, Hamas, uh, uh, A History from Within in the US uh, edition and it's uh, in the British edition, it's called Hamas uh, Unwritten Chapters, that once we agree to treat people equally and look into grievances like they did in South Africa, give people back their rights, apologize to them if they were wronged, whatever, then we can all live together in peace as equal human beings, but not in a class society as is in Israel today. Let's go back a little bit in history to understand uh, uh, this. The Jews were persecuted in Europe. There is no doubt about this. They were treated very badly. And there were so many incidents in the 19th century up to the middle of the 20th century when there were pogroms, discrimination, racism, and then came the Holocaust. So some Jewish individuals uh, came up with the idea that the best thing for the Jewish problem to be resolved is to find, is to establish a country for the Jews alone. Now, where, where do you do that? At the time, most Jews objected to this. They said, this, this is nonsense. 
uh, there are Jews in Britain, but they are British Jews. There are Jews in France, but they are French Jews, like there are French Christians, like there are French Muslims. There are Jews in Poland, but they are Polish Jews. Why do you want to take them out of their country and send them to somebody else's country? Only when this idea became supported by the colonial powers that won the First World War, that it was possible to create a Jewish home uh, in Palestine. So the whole idea of having a country just for the Jews is a silly idea, but unfortunately it was adopted by the colonial powers for their own purposes. Because look today, Israel claims to be a Jewish state, but there are a lot more Jews living outside Israel than in Israel. Why are there still Jews in America, for instance, or in Britain or in France, or even back in Germany? Many Jews have come back to Germany, to Poland, to the Czech Republic, uh, Jews in South Africa, Jews in Canada, everywhere. Because the idea that you need a country for the Jews is a fallacy, is a wrong idea. It, it hasn't solved the problem. Now they claimed at the time that if they have a country of their own, then they will not be harmed. They will be safe. But look at what's happening in Palestine today. Since they started coming to Palestine in the early 20s of last century, until today, there is no peace. There is no security because they don't come in peace. They, they come to take my mother's house and my father's land. So we have this clash all the time, this confrontation, this war. The only solution to this problem is for them to come to realize, and I'm sure this will happen sometime in the near future, that this whole idea of having a Jewish home just for the Jews doesn't work. It's impossible, especially that it is implemented by taking other people's homes and houses. Now today, unfortunately, they have a government in Israel that is so extremist. It has entered into alliance with Jewish fanatics who believe that this land here, Palestine, where my ancestors lived for thousands of years, was promised to them by God. And therefore, because God gave it to them, nobody else has the right to be there. Now, this is stupid, isn't it? Now, imagine if this happens anywhere else in the world. If, say, to, today in America, someone claims that America is only for the Christians, or America is only for the Jews, or America is only for the Muslims, what will happen to him? People will say he is crazy or she is crazy uh, or inciting violence among followers of different religions. Only Israel in the entire world is allowed by the Western powers to get away with claiming that God gave them the right to take somebody else's homes and lands. It's crazy, it's just crazy. excellent question and the answer to this is that international relations is not based on ethics and morality international relations is not based even on justice or equality international relations is based on interests and the balance of power and look let's take you back to the example of south africa for how long were the whites in South Africa, oppressing the blacks, claiming that God gave them license to do this. And at the same time, they were supported by Britain. They were supported by America. They were supported by France. They were supported by most countries in the world, although they were committing a crime, a crime of oppressing the natives just because their skin is black. Now, when did this come to an end? It came to an end when the people of South Africa struggled for their freedom. 
Similarly, we Palestinians, if we don't struggle for our freedom, the international community doesn't care about us. That the international community is only concerned about its own interests. Look at the United States of America, where you are now. How do people become congressmen and congresswomen? Most of them, not all of them, but most of them. How do they become presidents? How do they become governors? The democratic process in the United States of America is based on funding. And much of this funding comes from interest groups. And interest groups use the lobby in order to dictate policy on people who are supposed to be elected by the people. And one of the strongest lobbies in America is the pro-Israel lobby, the lobby that supports Israel. I mean, look at politicians in America. Only when they leave office, whether they are a former president, a former governor, a former senator, a former uh, representative, that they speak the truth. When they are in the office, very few of them there speak the truth. Why? Because they need the support of those who enabled them to become president or member of the House or member of the Senate. It's, if you really think about it, this is a corrupt aspect of democracy. Of course, democracy is great, but unfortunately in America, as uh, the uh, famous uh, Italian uh, philosopher uh, Norberto Bobbio once said, these are the broken promises of democracy. Democracy is supposed to be truly representative of the people, but in, in reality, it is representative of capital. It is representative of those who have money, those who have power, and those who have influence. And that's why the international community is doing nothing. Look at the United Nations. Right from the day it was set up, the United Nations was set up so that only the powerful can get things through its offices done. Look at the Security Council. There are five permanent members of the Security Council. The Security Council cannot support justice anywhere in the world if one single member of the Security Council does not uh, agree. America keeps using the veto in order to uh, nullify any uh, draft resolution that would uh, condemn Israel or would demand something out of Israel in favor of the Palestinians. Since this problem started, this has been going on. So what's the point of the United Nations? It's a useless platform. It's a useless organization because it doesn't represent us ordinary human beings in our societies. It represents the powerful. And the powerful will only listen to the weak when the weak is capable of defending his or her position. The Arab peoples, yes. The Arab peoples all sympathize with Palestine because they consider Palestine to be an Arab and Islamic and humanitarian uh, cause. But I regret to say that most Arab countries are so useless because they are ruled by undemocratic regimes. Nobody elected those governments. And that's why 10 years ago, uh, 10 years ago, we had an uprising in the entire Arab world, the Arab Spring, it's called, because the Arab masses were sick and tired with all these this, the tyrants, with all these dictators not actually representing their best interests. Today, unfortunately, there are six Arab countries, Egypt, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan that have full diplomatic relations with Israel and oh. that continue to normalize relations with Israel despite what Israel is doing today to the Palestinians. It's shameful, it's most shameful. And uh, since uh, the beginning of last week, people in Morocco have been taking to the streets every day, demonstrating and asking their governments to sever ties with Israel, to stop normalization. But they don't listen because they don't listen to their people. The same in the other countries. But of course, we hope that this will change. It will not be the same. 
You see, the problem is that the Arab masses need to be liberated as well. Not only Palestine needs to be liberated. The Arab human being needs to be liberated from tyranny, from dictatorship, and from these corrupt regimes. And inshallah, Palestine will uh, enable the Arabs to rise and break the shackles and liberate themselves. There is more support coming from Iran, Pakistan, and Turkey, but these are quite far away from Palestine. There is very little they can do. Yeah. I mean, look at the neighbors of Palestine. Egypt, Egypt is so close. Yeah. It's just next to it. And Egypt is not doing much in order to stop the Israelis from bombarding Gaza. Every day, houses are bombed and demolished on the heads of children and, uh, and women and men living in them. What are the Egyptians doing? At least Egypt could have said, Israel, if you don't stop this, we are going to have no more ties with you. At least they could have said this, but they haven't, unfortunately. I think what we need to do is build up a global movement for justice, a global movement for the end of racism and apartheid in Palestine. But how can we do this if we don't inform people about what's going on and about the roots of the conflict, about the, the reasons for having the problem there? People who knew how this uh, came to be, sympathize with the Palestinians because they understand. But many of the people who support Israel blindly know very little about the background. And I think this is where our role comes. My role, your role, her role, everybody as an individual, as a community, as an institution of civil society, our duty our responsibility is to learn, to educate ourselves first, to understand better, and then to convey that understanding to the rest of the people. And then maybe then people will start influencing their politicians, will start objecting to someone like Biden saying that if Israel didn't exist, America should have created Israel. What is this? How can someone intelligent say something like this unless he is either so stupid, and I don't think he is stupid, I think Biden is intelligent, or he is so blindly biased toward Israel for his own political interests, like every politician in the world. So we need to educate people. We need to tell people about this. You know, today I saw a very interesting video clip uh, for a Syrian family in America, forgot which uh, state in America, but somewhere in America, and they decided to give people ice cream free of charge and just asking them in exchange for having the free ice cream to go and search Palestine. Please take this ice cream, go and learn about Palestine. A very innovative, a very genius, uh, uh, ingenious way of, uh, of uh, getting the people to learn more about what's going on in Palestine. Uh, and I, th I think this is, this is an important responsibility. This is not a small thing. Uh, I remember as a young student, when I was in, uh, in the UK studying in the 70s, I used to see in Trafalgar Square, so, uh, those of you who have been to London uh, probably know where Trafalgar Square is, very, very central. In Trafalgar Square, there is the Embassy of South Africa. Students, young men and women, were taking shifts, rotations, of a picket in front of the South African Embassy in Trafalgar Square, 24 hours a day, to protest against apartheid. At that time, British politicians used to support apartheid. American politicians used to support apartheid. You know what Margaret Thatcher once said? Margaret Thatcher, who was a famous uh, Iron Lady, the Prime Minister mm -hmm. of Britain, she once said about Nelson Mandela when he was still in prison, 
Nelson Mandela is a terrorist, she said, and he would never be allowed to set foot on British soil. Now we saw what happened later. Nelson Mandela became free. He freed his people. He freed his country. And he came to London and he took a march in London as a hero, as a hero, not for his, just for his South African people, as a hero for humanity, because he was indeed the champion of humanity. This is what the Israelis wanted to do. They wanted a blackout so that nobody knows what's going on. But if you switch on, on Al Jazeera now, whether Al Jazeera English or Al Jazeera Arabic, you will find uh, six to eight satellite links at the same time from different towns in Palestine. Oh. They bombed the office in Gaza, but uh, the heroic reporters in Palestine, not only of Al Jazeera, but of every uh, free uh, and decent news channel in the world are working from home. They're just carrying the cameras, walking around, challenging the Israelis and telling the world what's going on. You can watch the Turkish uh, Terate, the Turkish Terate world the channel. So they have so many correspondents in Palestine. You can watch Al Jazeera. You can watch. Uh, I haven't been, because I'm in Jordan at the moment, I haven't, I haven't been watching much uh, Western uh, TV channels. But I, I assume that some of them are also reporting on the, on the event. This is a major event. It cannot be hidden. It cannot be concealed. There can be no blackout. He said the Israelis yeah. have the right to defend themselves. What about the victims of the Israelis? What about the Palestinians who are massacred every day? Now we have about close to 250 uh, Palestinians killed in Gaza, at least one third of them are children. What about them? To Biden and politicians in the Western world, unfortunately, Palestinians don't count. But I'll tell you how we will count. We will count through our resistance. We will count through our steadfastness. We will count through our struggle. And we will force the world to see the truth for what it is, inshallah. When someone needs to know a little bit about Hamas, and that's why I wrote yeah. my book. Now, what is Hamas? Hamas is a group of people who came together and formed a resistance movement in Gaza. Now, the population of Gaza today is about 2 million Palestinians. 1.8 million of them are refugees. Refugees from where? Refugees from towns and cities that are today called Israeli and that are uh, inhabited by Jews who came from outside Palestine. These are Palestinians. Hamas is Palestinian. It comes from within the Palestinian people. But of course, anybody who does not agree with the position of world powers can easily be called a terrorist. I, as I have explained earlier, even Nelson Mandela was called a terrorist. Now, if defending one's people, if defending one's homeland, if defending one's honor is terrorism, then I am the first terrorist. If terrorism means you struggle for justice, you struggle for human rights, you struggle for freedom, then I'd love to be a terrorist if that's what terrorism is. But I'll tell you what terrorism is. Terrorism is invading other people's countries. Terrorism is taking other people's lands. Terrorism is throwing people out of their homes to bring somebody else to live in them, like my mother's house, which is now inhabited by Jewish immigrants because my mother was thrown out of it. They can go to any house. They can arrest anybody they want. Uh, they, uh, and they use their own court system to oh. justify this by getting a court order of eviction. Hundreds of families have, uh, I'm not talking here about Gaza, I'm talking about the West mm -hmm. Bank. Not only the West Bank, even Haifa, Yaffa, 
Akka, these are the towns that were occupied in 1948. Hundreds of Palestinian families became homeless because police came with a court order, court eviction order, and threw them out and gave that house to a Jewish settler family. Well, here I'm talking of personally, I'm not talking about any uh, of, uh, official position. I personally believe that we have, an exp we have uh, a precedent in history. We have a past experience that we can learn from. That's when the Crusaders came from Europe and occupied Palestine, uh, remained in uh, Jerusalem for about 100 years, but in the coastal area for about 300 years, but eventually, they were defeated and they surrendered. So Salah al-Din, the famous uh, Muslim uh, leader or commander, gave them the choice. He said to them, you want to live with us in peace as equal human beings? You are most welcome. You can stay. You want to go back to wherever you came from? We will help you. And he actually built ships for those who preferred to return. And he put them in those ships and sent them back to England, to Germany, to France, whatever. I believe personally that historically speaking, we never had a problem with the Jews. And we can coexist with the Jews as followers of religions. They, are, they follow their Judaism, we follow our Islam, our uh, other fellow Palestinians follow their Christianity. We can live together. But if any of them is unhappy to live with us as equals, it's up to them. They can go if they want to. Uh, this happened in South Africa as well. I met, I went to South Africa in uh, 1996 after the end of apartheid, of apartheid. And that wasn't my first visit. That was my third or fourth visit to South Africa. But on that particular visit, I met uh, a South African white man I met him in the Western Transvaal, far away from urban cities. He was an artist and he used uh, an area in the, in, the, in, the, in the mountains and set up his own um, place for paintings and things of this sort. He said to me the following. He said, this country was given to us by God. And we are superior to these blacks. We cannot live with them. That's why I've come here and I'm looking for a place to go to where I don't see them anymore. Now, if somebody has this mentality, if somebody thinks he is so superior to others, of course he will not agree to live with others. Let him go and live wherever he wants. If he can keep that uh, racist mentality. But today, nobody in the world accepts that racism. Nobody. You cannot claim just because you have a white skin that you are better than a black person. This is, uh, it's not, it's not, it, it's a crime. It's not just insanity. It's a crime uh, in, in the eyes of the, of the law everywhere. So going back to the envisaged solution, if they agree that they did so much wrong to us, and they agreed to renounce the idea that God gave them a promise that they should come and take our homes, there is room for all of us to live together in peace. Whatever, it doesn't have to be Palestina. It can be a completely new reality. We could come together, all these small useless countries, make a federation or a, 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 a unity, and call ourselves the United States of the Middle East, like, just like the United States of America. Because frankly speaking, I mean, uh, if you look at the, at the Middle East and North Africa, they are all very small, stupid countries. They don't have enough water, each of them that is. Some of them have plenty of water, but no oil. Some have a lot of oil, but no water. Some have no population, but a lot of money. Some have so many people, but no money. So we need to come together, create a new uh, powerful entity that combines all our resources, human as well as material.
where we can live together. And uh, there, there, can, there can indeed be peace if we choose our own government and make that government accountable. And if we adhere to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I'm already now 66 years old. I don't know in my case, but I am optimistic that my children or my grandchildren will go back because the struggle is going on. It's nonstop. In every struggle, the struggle of the Algerian people to liberate themselves from France, the struggle of the Vietnamese people to liberate themselves from American imperialism, the struggle of the South African people to liberate themselves from apartheid. In every struggle, there are people who lived on to see victory, but there are many people who did not live enough, long enough to see victory. It doesn't matter.